What's up, Falcons fans, and welcome to episode 18 of Talking Birdie, an Atlanta Falcons podcast powered by SportstalkATL.com. I am your host, Matt Carley. You can find me on Twitter at Matt Carley, Carley spelled K-A-R-O-L-Y. And I'm joined as usual by my two co-hosts from the Sports Talk ATL team, Jake Gordon. You can find him on Twitter at Can't Guard Jake. And Alex Lord, you can find him on Twitter at Go Sports Talk. Go spelled G-E-A-U-X. And no guests for tonight, but, uh, you know, some good news. Finally, personally, the preseason's over. Uh, Falcons dropped their third one. They went 0-3 in the preseason, lost to the Browns in prime time. Not as bad as I thought it might be. Uh, they only lost 19-10, to uh, put up a fight, had a chance for a game-winning Josh Rosen drive, which would have been uh, pretty special, even though it's preseason in his debut. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. We also got, obviously, uh, today's cut-down day. We're recording this on our usual Tuesday uh, so we'll get into the 53 man roster. That'll be the meat and potatoes of the show. But I do want to spend some time here talking about that final preseason game. And I guess I'll, I'll start with the Josh Rosen uh, storyline. Cause I thought that was uh, my biggest takeaway was, you know, how impressive he looked, uh, you know, only three days of practice and, you know, running with the third team, you know, the offense, put together their most productive drives, in my opinion, when he was on the field and uh, just the arm strength, that was the first thing that popped off to me was, you know, the ball was coming out well. And, and Josh kind of talked about that in his press conference, which was also, you know, uh, you know, a great takeaway. He had a 10 to 11 minute press conference after the game and uh, really was candid and opened up about his experiences thus far in the NFL after being a former 10th overall pick. But I want to get your guys thoughts uh, Jake, we'll start with you. Uh, what did you make of the Josh Rosen debut? And is that, do you think that's the reason he's on the 53 man roster right now? Um, well, I was at the game and he had some good throws, obviously, but he had a lot where it was still like, okay, yeah, we haven't, you know, turned uh, chicken scratch or, uh, yeah, chicken scratch into chicken salad. Exactly. Um, but I mean, he just looks like a backup quarterback. I feel like he's somebody Arthur Smith could work with and, with way with waiver wire day coming up, we could be talking about the you know joking about the Josh Rosen era being over already next week. Um, I think they would probably keep him over Franks, but who knows? You know, if somebody like Brian Hoyer, uh, even maybe like Trevor Simeon, somebody like that comes along, uh, maybe they do hold on to him. But uh, I thought he looked fine. Uh, I think he has matured a lot. Uh, he just kind of sounds like he has, even if he hasn't. So. You know, seems like a nice kid. Uh, I'm glad he at least got a got a little bit of exposure, and you know, who knows, maybe he'll stick. Alex, uh, thoughts on Rosen? Yeah, um, I think that he showed exactly what we kind of maybe all thought, or at least people who had like looked at him a little bit more deeper than you know just what surface level stuff. He has a great arm. He is terrible outside of the system. Outside of you know an unscripted an unscripted play, his accuracy you know goes down quite a bit. Even if he was uh, pressured on that touchdown throw, uh, the data shows more often than not he's not completing that pass. Um, he is not good under pressure, even though I just said he did, he did throw a touchdown uh, with somebody in his face. But you know from past games, I just think that Jake nailed it right there. I mean he's a backup quarterback through and through. Uh, at least at this point in his career, um, there's that's not to say he can't ascend to one day becoming, you know, a decent starting like a Matt Schaub having a couple good seasons. Um, but I certainly think he's uh, uh, head and shoulders above Frank's. You can just tell he was much more comfortable with like a week in Arthur Smith's offense. I mean, he looked head and shoulders like he could command an offense better than Frank's could. Um, I came away impressed and also a little bit he left something to be desired because he didn't know the playbook that well there was a couple of missed uh throws that you guys might have noticed uh and it was clear he was just having a miscommunication with his receivers and that's well, yeah. definitely because of the you know fact that he's what been here a week if that yeah i think the one you're probably alluding to is the one that preceded the touchdown throw to Jawan Green in the corner where, 
It was Juwan the same drive. Of, yeah, was it, it, it was play before. Yeah, uh, Nate Tice on Twitter actually posted, and I retweeted it. It was the same. Arthur Smith was testing Josh clearly, and and he talked about it after the game. He ran the same exact play first time around. You know, Jawan Green's running that whip route, that blaze out that Julio has made famous. Josh ends up throwing the dig, yeah, to the back of the end zone instead of the corner. Missed them, and there was the miscommunication there. And then the very next play, Jawan, you know, the, the same route concept was called. Josh kind of, you know, didn't have his clean of a pocket, had to be falling away. And again, that there was the arm strength. I thought that he put on display was falling away, was still able to put pretty good throw on the ball. And Juwan, you know, was able to toe tap for a touchdown. So yeah, clearly there's miscommunication. There's stuff left on the field. Josh noted it, but again, we, you know, three days of practice compared to Felipe Franks. He's been in the system the entire off season. I, I thought Josh matched him, if not exceeded him. I mean, I do think F- Felipe had his best game as a passer of the three. Uh, but when you put context, you know, when you add context to it and, and, you know, again, Josh just got into the system uh, and, you know, and I, I thought the play action concepts, which again, that's the base concepts, you know, three, four step drop, turn, pivot, and, you know, the guys running the dig over the middle, you saw it twice, which or three times, I think maybe even with Juwan Green, he dropped the first one, caught the other two. This offense can suit him. You know, it's it's a very quarterback friendly offense. We've we've heard that countless times. You know, after all, this is an offense that led Matt Ryan to an MVP season. And the thing is, Josh Rosen doesn't have to be a starter. So talking about his potential to be a starter right now, uh, you know, I think is a moot point. I think this is the best situation for him to potentially, you know, resurrect his career. I mean, this, he's not going to get more, many more opportunities. If not, this, this is the last one. And for him to be able to sit behind Matt Ryan for a couple years here, I mean, he's only 24 and Jake pointed out, I think last week that he's the same age as Felipe Franks. You know, I have questions on why you keep both, but we'll get into that later. Uh, but I do think, you know, this performance showed enough to the point that you want to see more. Um, so that was my biggest takeaway on offense. You know, there wasn't really a whole lot else to talk about uh, from an offensive standpoint. If, if you guys disagree, jump in. Yeah. But Oh, I got it. All right. The, it was offensive uh, line, I'm the guessing. The line is, <laughs> yeah. oh, my God. Well, oh what, my that's goodness. nothing new, right? We, we've known okay, that. Yeah. You're right. Well, you don't, they don't need to hear it again. But just know <laughs> if you're yeah. listening or watching – and you didn't mm-hmm. see the preseason game, it wasn't encouraging on the offensive line. We can yeah, I mean, I mean, there's there's one that's still uh, – I still have pictures of it where both Dahlman and Mayfield basically got forklifted <laughs> into the backfield, into the lap of the quarterback. So I was surprised. PFF graded Mayfield pretty well. I mean, again, you know, I didn't rewatch the game, but uh, certainly when – when they were bad, they were, they were bad. And again, we've, we've seen that all throughout preseason. The depth is scary. Um, you know, again, we'll, we'll talk about the offensive line cause there was kind of a surprising decision with the 53 man roster. But, uh, as far as defensive, you know, the defensive performance goes, uh, again, Browns weren't playing, um, many, of their, and, you know, any of their top skill players. They did have Baker Mayfield in for a couple series and, and he did well, he, you know, Again, for me, that first touchdown, I just thought, you know, that was a perfect throw, and there's no defense for the perfect throw, uh, you know, to Kadero Hodge. Um, but, you know, they bent, uh, and, and we've we've seen this many times before with Falcons defense. They, you know, they were a bend, but don't really break. They had multiple fourth down stops, which hopefully that's something that will translate when it's, you know, first team versus first team uh, in the regular season. My biggest encouragement, and again, uh, you know, I, I noted this on Twitter, was the tip passes. And again, it's a small thing, but when you have a defense that hasn't had a lot of success with the players that they currently have uh, in terms of pass rush, getting their hands on the football is the next best thing. So seeing guys like Michael Walker and uh, I don't know, was it jo- jo- uh, Jonathan Bullard getting uh, tip passes? You know, for me, that was that was my biggest takeaway. Uh, Jake, what did you see anything live that stood out to you uh, as far as the defense goes? I mean, again, it was a quasi dress rehearsal game, not really, um, because guys like Grady Jarrett, Deion Jones weren't playing, but 
what what did you see out of the defense that excited you or worried you maybe? Uh, we'll get to it with cuts. So, okay, Alex, anything you want to add before on the defensive side of the ball before we uh, talk fifty three man roster breakdown? Um, say something positive and negative. Isaiah Oliver had a good play in coverage with going against the first team offense of the Browns. Um, and then also, as you mentioned, Grady Jarrett didn't play and Dante Val- Fowler was used sparingly. Uh, but the Cleveland offensive line, which is a top three unit in the league, I mean, absolutely handled the defensive front. I mean, there was no penetration on neither pass plays or run plays. But again, that's one of the best units in the league. And we didn't have our best two players out there. So, you know. It's a negative, but not really. So. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up Dante Fowler because that was one of the, the takeaways too. Uh, small one, you know, he didn't start the game. Uh, Steven Means, uh, Jacob Teodio Mayer were the starting outside linebackers, and that's how the depth chart has looked, you know, since the very first one was placed out there. Now, Dante Fowler did come in for a few reps. You know, one thing that I'm going to be keeping an eye on heading into week one is – you know, is Fowler's role as a situational pass rusher, uh, you know, to conserve his energy, to maximize his potential. And, you know, guys like Means and, you know, JTM are better suited as, you know, more every down players to defend against the run and, you know, also to add pass rush as well. So certainly something to monitor uh, going forward because, you know, Arthur Smith did say he's going to have to earn his opportunities. And, you know, this might be an example of that, but, uh, let's, let's get into the 53 man roster breakdown. Um, I guess I'll start by, I guess going through like we, like we did for our, our predictions and projections, you know, who ended up being on the 53 man roster. And then we'll talk, uh, you know, biggest surprise cuts. So start on offense. Um, you know, we kind of alluded to it a bit ago, when talking about Rosen and Franks, but they decided to keep three quarterbacks. So they're, and again, that's this, this is all subject to change, but right now the 53 man roster currently has Matt Ryan, Felipe Franks and Josh Rosen on the team Uh, running backs. uh, And I'm going to include Keith Smith here. So they got Keith Smith at fullback and then Mike Davis, Cordero Patterson and Quadri Allison. Those are the four running backs. Offensive line. They got eight guys, uh, Starting left tackle, Jake Matthews, Josh Andrews right now, the presumptive left guard starter, Matt Hennessy, the starting center, Chris Lindstrom, right guard, Caleb McGarry, right tackle. And then the backups, you got Drew Dahlman will be the swing interior offensive lineman. You got Jason Spriggs as the swing tackle. And then Jalen Mayfield is a guard slash tackle, but probably going to continue to focus his efforts at left guard. Tight end. Uh, three players there, Kyle Pitts, Hayden Hurst, Lee Smith. No surprises for the most part. Um, and then receivers, they did keep six, and Frank Darby's sticking around. So they got Calvin Ridley, Russell Gage, Alamany Zacchaeus, Christian Blake, Tajay Sharp, and Frank Darby. So that's the offense. Um, all right, let's break it. Let's let's stop there. Let's talk surprises on offense. Uh Jake, I'll let you go first. What was the biggest surprise to you on the offensive side for the 53-man roster? Uh, I I would probably say Caleb Huntley being left off. Uh, I guess they're pretty confident they can pass him through waivers. Uh, But, I mean, if you if you got to get to full running backs by including your fullback and technically a guy who's who's listed as a wide receiver, you're kind of stretching a bit there. So I thought they were going to keep Huntley with the way he played. Hopefully nobody scoops him up and they can keep him on the practice squad. Yeah, I I agree. Him or uh, you know Willie Beavers were mine, and again, it it does seem like, and we kind of noted it uh, in a previous show, but I think this is Mike Davis's backfield and his backfield alone. I mean, you're going to mix in Cordero Patterson as the gadget, change of pace, you know, move them all around, chess piece. But and I, I could be wrong, but again, based on the preseason and based on Allison playing a good bit the last two preseason games, I, I think he's more there. Uh, in case of an injury uh, or, or you sparing. I know that that won't sit well with some fans, but um, I, I think they really like Mike Davis. Uh, Alex, what what was the biggest surprise for you? Was it one of those two that I just mentioned? That Jake talked yeah, about. Yeah, um, I'll go maybe a different way. And 
It wasn't necessarily that either Parker Hesse or John Rain got cut. It was that they both got cut. And I know Parker Hesse is on the injured reserve, and I don't know the technical. He's the COVID. He's the COVID the list COVID right reserve. now. Yeah. So I don't know what the you know if he gets brought on that. I so don't he really know. he he could you know I'm glad you brought him up because he is on the COVID list. He could be, you know, one of those roster fluctuations because. Kendall Sheffield did make it. We'll talk about that. But, you know, he's likely to land on IR based on the fact that the injury timetable seems still indefinite. So if they do move him to IR, that's that's an opportunity for for Parker Hesse to be the fourth tight end. So it's possible he's still not, you know, uh, out of the picture. I just think that, you know, and it's different personnel, so I can't say that, you know, what – Arthur Smith did in Tennessee is going to do here. You know, that's obviously not true, but I would, the Falcons tight end group as it stands today is better than the tight Titans tight end group from last year. And absolutely. So I don't know why he would use, you know, fewer tight end combination formations. So my whole point is he kept full. They kept four with Tennessee last year. And I think it's purely because of depth purposes. You know, you play three, you know, he plays three every single game. They're going to come out at least one play every game with three tight ends on the field. And so I just think that how could you not, you know, have somebody in reserve? Lee Smith is very old. Um, Kyle Pitts is very green. I just think it would it would benefit the group as a whole to have a fourth guy there to it. I don't know. I just. I'm scratching my brain. I think that well, the running back group makes a little bit more sense. I agree Mike Davis will be that bell cow, but I think Cordero Patterson is going to set rec- set uh, career highs in carries and yards this year. I think he's going to be a big part, not a big part of the offense, but he's going to carry the ball out of the backfield more than people are expecting. So the three running backs doesn't necessarily surprise me, although I did I agree with Jake that – I, I thought for sure Caleb Huntley was going to make the team, especially after uh, JV and Hawkins got uh, waived. So I, I think the the three tight ends shocks me more than anything. A couple points to add to that. I mean, again, and we talk about when when you get to this point, um, rosters are churning. I mean, we're seeing it that you know there's been trades left and right around the league. You know, we're going to get the waiver wire uh action tomorrow i think noon time noon eastern time tomorrow on wednesday is the deadline for that so there's going to be some transactions and i'd imagine there's a a couple for the falcons and one name that i think just became available is richard rogers the tight end uh that was formerly of the eagles i believe they decided to cut him uh and you know he was with the eagles the last several seasons and you know we know justin peel the new tight end coach uh was the tight end coach in Philly. So he's someone to monitor and and he could be potentially, you know, a fourth tight end added, but also something to keep in mind. And I pointed this out on Twitter, you know, back kind of when Arthur Smith was hired, just because he did something in Tennessee. I mean, we've talked about how much he loves tight ends and, you know, he's I, that, that doesn't change, but, uh, you know, if, if he doesn't have the personnel to run it, he, I think he's going to be flexible. You know, he's going to use That's my point, though, like the personnel is there. The tight end group in Atlanta is definitely better than the tight end. group. Well, and they're going to they're going to use the three that they got. But why do they need to add a fourth then? Just purely for injury purposes. I mean, Lee Smith is old as old as all. Yeah. And I'm not I mean, Lee Smith, we've said, is going to be a sixth offensive lineman more times than not. Exactly. And but but again, when you have I don't know when you have a Kyle Pitts and a Hayden Hurst, that's a strong duo. You just you want to get those guys on the field as much as possible. You don't really need to necessarily have a third guy mixing in because then that means one of those guys might not be on the field. So you know, I'm okay with it. I totally disagree. H- having Lee Smith on the field with both of them at the same time opens up Look, hey, a whole part of the offense because you don't know if Kyle Pitts and Hayden Hurst are on the same side you know, of the formation or they're on opposite sides, you know, more often than not, you're like, it's probably a pass. Just, you, just you were setting me up perfectly, and I appreciate it. But Lee Smith is going to catch a touchdown on tight end leak. 
It's happening. Yeah, I'm bet, sure. Bet, I'm bet sure. money on it. That's that's the I'm that's not, the I'm instant not. money prop bet of the season. Lee Smith is going to leak out. He's going to be wide arguing. open because, like you said, so I, I think it's another aspect of the game. You know, yeah. So I don't think having Lee him on, Smith and Kyle Pitts right next to each other is beautiful. Yeah, because all the attention is going to be on on Pitts yeah. and. Smith is going to get some looks. Uh, so that's something I'm actually looking forward to, one of those underrated things. But, again, you know, we talk about it with Derrick Henry. Just because, uh, you know, a lot of people wanted to credit Arthur Smith's success to Derrick Henry. And, you know, Henry was great for that offense. But Arthur Smith's not going to lead the league in in first down carries, I don't believe, with Mike Davis now. He's going to use his personnel. He's going to know he's got Calvin Ridley. He's got Hayden Hurst. He's got Kyle Pitts. You know, he's going to use what they got and the strengths that they got on this team. So, yeah, did he lead the league or second in the league in two tight end sets? Or, and was he first or second in three tight end sets? Yes. And we might still see a whole lot of that or or we might not. You know, again, I, I would lean towards, you know, the base personnel is going to be a lot of two tight ends just because, Again, your top four pass catchers, two of them are tight ends. But, you know, I don't think we can be so uh, structured into our thinking of, you know, based on what Arthur Smith did in Tennessee, it's necessarily going to be a copy and paste in Atlanta. A lot of things will look similar. I mean, the offense schematically with the outside zone and the play action and the boots and stuff, that'll be in there. Um, and again, right now we're at three tight ends. I, I believe if Jaden Graham was – didn't get hurt he's that fourth tight end like it's almost you can write that in pen so it was unfortunate and they have to kind of you know change their plan and their thinking and and maybe again a guy like richard rogers um with the familiarity could be that perfect less less point i'll make about this with familiarity uh michael pruitt was also released today oh uh, was he yeah i love that so that would be great too Jacob um, Hollister as well, Matt Lacoste. There's a there bunch go. of good tight ends so there, out there. So, yeah, I'm just saying again, this, that, uh, I think that there will be four – I'm saying this now. I think there will be two quarterbacks on the roster, neither are – and the backup is not currently on the roster, and I think there will be four tight ends going into the Eagles game. Well, That's if we're giving out predictions – or we're giving out Let's takes. I'm gonna I'm gonna say the Falcons would be remiss to not add one of these receivers that are coming available, especially Tyron Johnson, especially Daz Newsome. Daz Newsome, look, you know, he showed a little bit in the preseason. That's a free draft pick. The guy was what a fifth round, sixth round draft pick. It's a free draft pick. I mean, uh, unless you really like Christian Blake that much, uh, Tyron Johnson was one of the better deep threats in the entire NFL last year. So I don't, I, I really don't see the logic in not at least putting a claim in on one of those guys. Even though wide receiver is not the biggest issue, a lot of people don't know this, which I really didn't know it until a couple hours ago. But uh, your waiver priority doesn't reset after you claim somebody. If you claim five guys, you get all five. So there's no hurt in adding a wide receiver like that. Yeah. I think you can upgrade Christian Blake uh, or maybe even Frank Darby very, very easily tomorrow. Don't you think that there was like an abnormal amount of like mid-round picks that got cut? Like – rookie fifth round picks i saw i don't know how many like a handful of them get cut well there was a guy from tennessee des des patrick yeah, they traded uh, up des fitzpatrick him. they traded up for him yeah, in the fourth round and he's cut That's crazy. wide receiver uh so that, you hate to see that <laughs> you hate to see yeah that. i do like that daz newsome one i mean i was i mocked him in a few of my mock drafts throughout you know in, in, on day three and he's a guy that could provide yeah, speed that. Yeah, I thought he was going to be like a third round pick too. I mean, he's dynamic. Yeah. He's a really good playmaker. And, he, and uh, he's a return yeah. guy too, right? So, yeah, special um, teams warrior would like it, but John yeah, Jake, Brown. I don't think I don't think Jake you're even out of like bounds saying that Christian Blake and Frank Darby could be replaced. I don't <laughs> I would take I would take Aaron Johnson and Daz Newsome over those like if that's if you, you do know? like a straight swap, mm -hmm. I would take that. Yeah, I I don't see why that shouldn't even like you know, it's better. I think part of me thinks they're keeping Frank Darby because they're like, mm, maybe he'll develop next year. If he doesn't do anything, I mean, just everything I saw, it was just, he looks small, smaller than I thought he was um, on the field. But I think that they're keeping him for the wrong reasons. I really do. That oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a new regime. And again, you see it very often. That's why I posed the question to Mike Rossi last week. It's like, 
you know, they, I don't think they want to swallow their pride in their first draft class that, that they missed, you know? Right. So I, I think they are going to keep him for that reason. And that might not be the right reason. Uh, but, and that's why I think, you know, with, I, I don't know exactly if you guys off the top of your head know what pick Daz Newsom was because I can't see them, especially if Daz Newsom was he after Darby. Cause if he was after Darby, I can't see them cutting Darby. The I mean, that would be a shock. 21st pick. Okay. So he was after that's, Darby. So you're essentially a, saying, well, we should have taken pick. this. Go ahead. Darby I'll was one. Darby was 187. I know that for, for a fact. Okay. Yeah. So it was 40 picks later. So that's why I don't know if they necessarily would do that. It's almost like them uh, cutting Kurt Benkirk on the phone and say, Hey Kirk, this isn't why we're calling you. We're letting you go. And then now they're calling him up because he's available and saying, Hey, uh, you want to come back to Atlanta? I, th- I think it would be very similar, maybe not as awkward of a phone conversation to a guy like Daz. That's Newsom, such a but... funny story, though. <laughs> just like, I, hey, that's man, why I'm I excited it. That's to why, get after it. <laughs> that's why I want him back, just for that alone. Like that story alone. That you know, life's funny sometimes. So um, we'll see. You know, wide receiver would be lower on the list of of moves that I see them making or thinking they could make. For me, I mean, offensive line. You look at the fact they only kept eight. And Willie Beavers, who, you know, let's talk about him for a sec before we move on. Willie Beavers was a guy, some people on Twitter were contemplating a reality Name where he's him. starting. <laughs> Name we, him. No, we don't talk about him on the show. We don't talk everyone, about him. Everyone, everyone, uh, everyone knows. I mean, he wasn't alone, but, uh, there were you know, notable uh, names saying Willie Beavers could start. And then yeah. also well, people well, saying we could trade Caleb. And McGarry. the other surprising thing is like the coaching staff even talks about like hey he's earned these reps at first team you know is that just coach speak because how does he go from that a week or so ago to jason spriggs is is beats him out and he's the swing tackle i so that was a weird development culture it's a culture thing for sure that he's just trying to instill you know you earn everything you're given around here maybe yeah. I, I'm gonna be honest, guys. I'm I'm not. I'm trying to not get excited for tomorrow because let's let's just be honest. This new regime has been incredibly boring. Like you know, I'm not saying they've been <laughs> bad, but they have been boring. Like yeah, they, the free agent class, pretty boring. The draft class, yeah. pseudo boring. I, I don't expect them to go out and just pluck like seven guys tomorrow. I just don't think it's gonna happen. Yeah, you're probably any, any, right. I'd like to be wrong, but I just don't see it happening. No, I, the more time that passes, I mean, all these trades coming up and the Falcons aren't a part of them despite some of their issues at left guard and offensive line depth and an edge rusher. Yeah, I, I wouldn't get my hopes up. But again, I, I'd i put the line at, at two moves because you look at the quarterbacks and, you know, we talked about them keeping three. I just don't. You know, for me, it's like they're keeping Franks and Rosen or they're keeping Franks because, you know, he knows the playbook better. So God forbid something happens where Matt Ryan, you know, goes down in week one if I, I and they keep this structure. Franks would be the first guy up just because of the fact that, again, he's not running around and to steal a line from Josh Rosen like a chicken with his head cut off. Like he at least knows the offense. You you can call every play and it's not like, Hey, you good with this? And Josh is like, yeah, I think so. So I think that's why he's here right now. Rosen's there because he impressed and they want to get a longer look. But again, you know, if they're going to bring in a veteran, they, they want to have someone that knows the playbook a little bit better than the veteran, just in case until that guy gets up to speed. So We'll, we'll see what happens. I, I think quarterback's something to monitor, too. Trevor Simeon was let go by the Saints, but apparently the Saints want to bring him back. I don't, I don't know what sort of, uh, you know, handshake agreement they got going on, but that was one that, you know, I think we both all kind of said uh, makes sense. But I, I think they're going to do something. Uh, so I'd say it's two, and, you know, you can, guys can take the over-under on that. But I, I know, would, based yeah, on what I we're was- seeing here, yeah, I was exploring like offensive line because I saw Michael Jordan got cut, and I'm like, is that is that where I'm at now? I'm I'm trying to take uh, scraps from the Bengals. Like, nah, I just I I didn't see anybody to where I was like, oh yeah, we need to we need to get him. Like, I mean, yeah. you said the defensive back from Washington, uh, whose name is escaping me, Jimmy Moreland. Like, yeah, Jimmy Moreland. Apparently, he only has a bruise on his knee, and he'll be ready for Week One. 
a guy yeah. like that. Um, but as far as offensive line, I didn't see anybody to where I was like, oh, this guy is going to improve, you know, improve our team right now. So J.R. Sweezy might uh, be lateral. <laughs> all, right, uh, all right, all right. He might I, be lateral. Anybody who was on the lateral. Seahawks offensive line from like 2014 to 2017 or whenever, no, none of those guys. He's got a cool name. He's got a bodyguard name. J.R. Sweezy. That I, is I, yeah, I think name. I might trust him more than Josh Andrews, but that just – That's what I'm saying. He's, he's probably a lateral move to Josh Andrews, but it would make me feel better that like they're trying. Yeah, he's got more trying. starts under his belt than, than Andrews, so – you know, I the the name that I guess that this is all cooled down, but uh, Connor McGovern from the from the Cowboys. I know Todd Archer, the ESPN reporter, mentioned the Cowboys might be willing to to offload him. Uh, you know, he's been in he's a 2019 draft pick, I believe, third round uh, at a Penn State. Now he has only played right guard, I guess, uh, in the starts he has made for the Cowboys, which you know it seems like all the available guards um i know albert briere suggested uh laurent uh, duvernay tardif being you know on the trading block for the chiefs because of how they've kind of retooled their entire offensive line but again he's been a career right guard so it's it's just kind of well, unfortunate where period of time when the team was allowed to sign players and there were like some good ones available and they could have picked <laughs> one of those guys yeah so, wow josh uh, andrews I, it, it, that that's the most confusing free agents uh, approach that they've made uh, is just sitting on Josh I, Andrews. I, bought into it. I think yeah, I, I mean, think they I bought, thought. Jay well, Michael I thought was they weren't develop. done. Like yeah, I well, or just you know having a veteran there, and you know they were going to either get a draft pick that they felt good about, which I I guess that's Jalen Mayfield, but to take a tackle who's never played guard before and. You know, your expectation is he's going to beat out Andrews. It's, it's the tough. same stuff with with Larry Wofford and um, uh, and uh, James Carpenter and Jamon Brown two years ago, or three years ago. I'm like, why are we spending money on two like the same amount of money on two bad tackles for our uh, guards for the money we could spend on one good one? Yeah, uh, I Roger Snaffle. Yeah, that I just can, think it's can a you imagine the resources? Yeah, Ima imagine. You know, for me personally, if we had Saffold and and got Arthur Smith and man, uh, I'd I'd be feeling really good about ten and seven, eleven and six. Um, <laughs> given I given that I offensive, get, I, I get free agency. Like I understand, you know, you got a, you got a lot of holes to fill, and I'm not saying everybody they brought in was bad, but I just feel like that they they didn't have a lot of money and they could have spent it in a much better way than they did. I get it. Yeah. I understand there's a process, but uh, if, if if it comes back next season and they win four games again, everybody's gonna it's it's gonna become even more puzzling. But I guess we'll see. Right. All right. Let's talk. Let's talk about the defense. Um, we'll go through. Uh, I'll start with the interior defensive line and go on down the list. Uh, I don't think there were any surprises there. I think we all got it right with the interior defensive line. Tyler Davidson, Grady Jarrett, Jonathan Bullard, Marlon Davidson, Daquan Graham, John Kaminsky, edge players. Steven Means, Jacob Tioti Mariner, Dante Fowler, Brandon Copeland, Ade Ogundeji, uh, linebackers, uh, Deion Jones, Foy Luakan, Michael Walker, and congrats uh, to the one and only undrafted free agent. Dorian Etheridge made it over the likes of Errol Thompson and Felipe Manuel Ellerby. Oh, Maybe. true. Sorry. Yeah. Not, yeah, but nobody ever thinks of him as an undrafted free agent, honestly. Yeah. Good, good enough to probably be drafted in the, I don't know, seventh round, but because of quarterback and all that. But um, cornerback AJ Terrell, Fabian Morrow, Kendall Sheffield, which again, surprise, and we'll talk about that. Isaiah Oliver, Avery Williams, Darren Hall, and uh, Alex, you can take a bow. You were the one from, from the outset. TJ Green made it as the seventh cornerback, but he also has some flexibility at safety. And then uh, rounding out the safety group, Deron Harmon, Eric Harris, Jalen Hawkins, Richie Grant. Biggest surprise on defense, Alex, I'll let you go first. Um, there weren't I, many, I don't think. I'm going like, to do two because one could be kind of not true in a couple of days. Is Kendall Sheffield making the roster? Um, and like you've said on Twitter a couple of times, I'm probably just going to head to IR 
which I mm-hmm. guess would put him out six weeks. Um, yep. And then if he's not eligible to return, I think two weeks after that, then it's he's done for the season. So I'll say that. I mean, maybe Actually, I think it might be three weeks. Sorry to cut you off. I think it might be three weeks uh, is all it is because they, they reduced it, I think, with the, you know, the new COVID provisions from last year. So uh, really, he only has to miss three weeks, I believe. Uh, we'll have oh, to double check no, on no, that. No, no, no. I know it's six weeks because I saw somebody else. Uh, David Bakhtiari's out for, six but he's on the he's on the pup list though. I think it's oh, different for that. Okay, so then I don't know. Okay, then I, don't I think know. the IR it used to be six weeks, I believe, but they they changed it again. It's a COVID provision that they carried forward this year. I believe it's only three weeks, but we'll get the official confirmation. I'm sure people will be tweeting it out, but I I, I think it is three weeks. So uh, yeah, go go ahead and continue as far as you know, basically Sheffield. all I was gonna say is Kendall Sheffield. He just hasn't been available, so like yeah. kind of the coaches don't even know what he has. So how are they kind? Of, you know, I'm just I'm confused how their assessment is going for him when there's absolutely nothing to go off of other than him and another coach's system under another regime. It just you know. I don't know. I thought Chris Williamson probably did enough to warrant a spot over him. But again, I didn't see, you know, inside the film room, inside of all the other stuff. And yeah. Well, and puzzling. again, there might be there might be some handshake agreement with Chris Williamson that again, once Sheffield goes to IR, he'll he'll get that spot. And then at that point, you know, Williamson can continue to hold down that fort. And if he does, then maybe they don't bring back Sheffield, but chances are if they're carving out this 53-man roster spot, they still want to get a longer look at a guy that, you know, brings speed, definitely took a step backwards last year, but, you know, under, he's still under contract for this year and next year, so that might be important to them given, you know, where they're still at in the salary cap and the fact that, you know, Oliver is an impending free agent, Fabian Moreau is on a one-year deal, so that that might play into it. Uh Jake, any other? Go ahead. One more thing. I think Williamston could probably get picked up off waivers. I I thought he. It's possible that much. Yeah, yeah. But you know, he faded in those last two games. He he played really well against the Titans. He got beat a couple times deep. But I still think there's something. He was the guy. He was the guy on the receiving end, I guess, of that Hodge touchdown. But again, I you know, I wouldn't fault him too much for that. I I I did I did think. I mean, it was almost like a Willie Beavers. <clears throat> yeah, we're talking. It was almost like a Willie Beavers situation. You know. Well, yeah, no, he was he was the corner. He was the cornerback four, though. You know, after you know, uh, Ter- Terrell, uh, AJ Terrell, Isaiah Oliver, and Fabian Moreau went off the field. You know, Chris Williamson was the first man up, just like you know Willie Beavers after Matthews and McGarry. You know, he was the first tackle up, and both those guys not being on this 53 man roster is definitely head scratching. But again, we'll see. Uh, maybe they're on standby. Uh, if they make it through waivers, then, you know, they'll likely be on the practice squad and, and some of the first guys called up it, in case of an injury. Uh, but I thought the defense was pretty straightforward for the most part. I mean, you know, we went back and forth. I know I went back and forth and ended up guessing wrong at the very end with Earl Thompson, but. Um, happy to see Dorian Etheridge. I mean, he really got off to a hot start with that first preseason game. And it's definitely the guy that you, you know, I guess trust to be more of a complete linebacker and play in coverage, which, you know, in today's NFL is it's paramount. So I think, and Jake I thought got too, that one. did you get that Jake Who? from the beginning? Which Dorian I think, Etheridge? yeah, on our, on our very, yeah. one of our very first shows, you threw him out as your undrafted guy. So again, yeah. Jake, take a bow as well. I mean, uh, great call, uh, you know. Happy to see it. this. This is always a fun time for the undrafted guys. And again, hopefully, he's here to stay for a little bit here, and maybe who knows for the future. Um, but uh, it, it was great to see, um, you know, an undrafted guy stick out because again, this team does need to rely on some some cheap contracts going forward. And you know, we'll see. Foyu Lukan, he's an impending free agent. Um, It'll be interesting what Michael Walker's role, uh, you know, he showed that he's a playmaker and he's an ascending talent. And, you know, based on the base uh, personnel, you know, he hasn't found his way. Like I, I would have expected him to be one of those edge guys. That's doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, 
So that's something to watch out for as far as, you know, what his role is, because they'd be making a mistake, I think, if they're not trying to get him on the field in, in unique ways. Um, or maybe, the, again, they're, he's, he's going to develop and maybe be the Aluakon replacement next year if they can't afford um, well, I to retain him. Well, I think what they could do is, you know, three three fives are something that Dean Pease loves to do. Um, and keeping those three linebackers on the field, I think, is – only beneficial i mean i just who would you have as your uh your three down lineman i'm curious in that first top top three probably tyler davison grady and i want to say jonathan bullard but so it's more it's more like a just a three three, i would 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 think three defensive linemen three down guys with their hands in the dirt and then three. Roaming well, do they need do they need to have their hands in the dirt? Because I like where your head's at, yeah, and, and we not. talk you about could have Dante Fowler out there if you wanted. If it was a third down situation, well, Stephen Means I think would be perfect for that because you know I thought his his best play as a Falcon has been when he's rushing from the interior. Uh, I think he's got the quickness to beat guys off the ball. I think as an edge rusher per se, he's a bit lacking, but. If you have Grady Jarrett, Stephen Means, and yeah, Dante Fowler, John Kaminsky, he's versatile. Marlon Davidson, I mean, you saw him play a, a similar type of role at times at Auburn where he's standing up, playing the edge and all that. So, again, this goes back to what we talked about, you know, at the beginning uh, of this series. You know, when we started the show, it, it's going to be an amoeba defense. From week to week, it might look completely different. You might see the regular 5-2-4. You might, you might see the 3-3-5. Three, three, that's the most exciting thing uh, that we're not going to know. Opposing offenses aren't going to know. I think they have, you know, some unique personnel here, especially again with guys like Davidson and Kaminsky and Walker and Aluakon, you know, Stephen Means. Uh, that's what's got me excited and, you know, not so down about uh this bunch because yes on paper do the individual names excite you not really there's a handful but how they can be all incorporated into one unit that's that's what fans should be excited about in my opinion um i guess we'll we'll talk about special teams uh just because they matter and uh you know there was a, a camp battle at punter and i believe was it was it me and you, Jake, or who who, who said uh, Maggio? Alex, was that you? I did the uh, Italian hands, <laughs> and I was so, wrong. So Maggio Cam Nizalak, the UGA alum and uh, Atlanta legend alum as well with, with Young Lake, who I think that's the coolest part about it is both of those guys reuniting uh, from their XFL days. I, I retweeted uh, you know, a post by Cam before going on the show here that you know, it's volume two, so... Cam Nides like won the punter battle. We'll see how long he sticks around. Sterling Hoffrichter was actually let go over the weekend uh, with an injury settlement. So the seventh round pick, another reason you don't draft specialists is again, you can find them on the streets like a guy like Cam Nizlak or on the streets like a young white coo who turns into a Pro Bowl kicker. Just go that route if you need a specialist. Who drafted, I mean, the, the Chargers who drafted cut the, Michael Badgley today. Solid. That was weird. I thought yeah. that was weird. Bobby Who Badger, drafted the punter or kicker probably four or five years ago in like the third round? Hold on, hold on. Don't say it. Don't say it, Matt. I want oh. you to guess because it's really Wait. easy to guess. Is this Seattle? It's a Florida no. State guy. It was uh, this State. is in uh, this is in Big Dick Energy, Michael Dixon from Seattle. I don't know when he got drafted, oh, but he was. Oh, it was like, okay. It was Tampa Bay. Yeah, it was Roberto Aguayo. Oh, he like oh, the, the third kicker. round. I thought we were talking about a punter. No, did you say punter? I don't know. Okay. What I said. Oh, yeah. That's. I think that was second round, wasn't it? Or was what? it third round? I yeah. Yeah. It was. It was second round. It's, I think they traded. It's up honestly. Round. If you're that putting together, yeah. If you're putting together a top five worst draft picks of all time, I don't know how that doesn't like. Maybe make one. Yeah. <laughs> Trading up in the second or round for a kicker, Oakland. and he flames out. Um, Four Oakland Raiders picks, and then that, and then that. Uh, we'll get his name in the podcast. We don't talk about him a lot, but Josh Harris, long snapper still for like one of the longest tenured Falcons. Josh Harris, uh, was, was the long snapper to finish off the 53 man roster. Um, yeah, I guess 
That about covers the breakdown. I'm trying to think of anything we missed, uh, didn't hit on. Again, uh, this is Jones, the roster. Uh, maybe could have made the roster, but he he definitely sealed his end fate when he was uh, when he got stripped after the interception. Oh, that was that was peak Falcons. That I mean, just... they, they they taught us that in elementary school. Don't don't carry the ball like a yeah. Ball. Yeah, but guess what, Jake? It doesn't look cool that way. My it kind of – it. well, that's, I was just, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought it up because that's exactly what it reminded me of is, is the days when Mike Vick did it. And that was like the most nerve-wracking part of watching the Falcons and him play was just how careless he was holding the football. But he can get away with it because he's Mike Vick. He never fumbled. Kobe Jones is not Michael Vick. So uh, as the great Keith Armstrong said, he's not good enough to be an asshole. Uh <laughs> And, uh, yeah, he, he, you know, again, I don't think he was making it, but certainly he ruined any chances of it after doing that. Um, any final thoughts? Um, you know, Matt Gano's on the PUP. So again, he's going to be out six weeks. I think the timeline for him, you know, will be November at the earliest. Uh, cause again, based on the offensive line depth, you know, I think they're going to want to see him, get him out there. Hopefully, you know, it's not in shambles prior to that. Hopefully someone locks it down. But man, that that's the thing I'm least looking forward to. Wait. Is I can't wait to record the Tuesday after the first game. I mean, I really can't. I can't. Because <laughs> I'm well, only I I've like only watched the left guards play. I've like almost watched probably every single snap of the preseason of the left guard. Just the two of Jalen Mayfield and uh, Josh Andrews, but I mean, it's just concerning. And I was the one who thought that Jalen Mayfield could come in and start from like day one. I was like, he, yeah, just because he, I don't, I don't even. Know. He looks like a little like um, a prepubescent kid out there, you know, like with <laughs> not saying he's a large individual. Yeah. He could throw me yeah. through a window. This is an insulting yeah. thing. He's yeah. just still a kid. He's not mature enough yet in his like grip. And in his upper body strength, I mean, he he gets thrown around by some of these, yeah. you know, second string defensive linemen. I mean, that's not good. Well, the leverage that he was playing with too is one of the things I noticed. Like he's playing too high, and you just yeah. that's that's a bad way to play. Um, yeah, I just think he needs a year of development. Uh, that's why I'm I'm not cool with him taking his lumps. I, I just you know. Get him on the – I know that's not a thing anymore because of Dan Quinn being gone. Get him on the Plan D uh, development program. Get him in that weight room. Make him so he's not looking dumpy as, as you know, Jake brought up and other analysts have, I guess, said about him. Uh, he, you know, he needs to refine his body. And, yeah, there's some work work to be done. And it's early, but, you know, I said this during the, the game. It's like I, I think that's a pick they're going to live to regret. I really do. So hopefully we're wrong on that. Hopefully I'm wrong on that. Um, but yeah, I just thought you know Quinn I Miners mean, is sitting right there. Why, well, why not take Quinn Miners? Up, I was just about to bring up my tweet has been pinned since January yeah. about Quinn Miners. January. Yeah, forget it, taking it, Kyle Pitts. Take take Quinn the Miners first at fourth pick. over. The first yeah, pick. trade up to the first pick. Yeah, yeah. You can build nah, a program around this guy, man. Yeah, no, nah, it just it made, still it made complete. Account. Shout out to that guy. <laughs> it makes complete sense. Uh, I don't know why they decided against it, but we'll see. Uh, again, trying to have some faith and patience, but uh, I'm not. I'm not very optimistic. Yeah, you're just being a fan. Just being a fan. Well, That's what yes, they did. but what, at the, what, what at the same we... time. Nobody yeah, at likes the same time patient people. Nobody likes a patient response from us, you know, in terms of sport. Like we, they want these results immediately. And, you mm -hmm. know, sometimes the NFL is a developmental league in certain mm -hmm. cases, but most of the times it's you're here and then you're gone. You know, if you don't make well, an impression, you're gone. I don't know. I don't know if you if you guys follow uh, Duke Manyweather, the the big O line. Uh, consultant that you know the O line summit. A lot of um, former and current offensive linemen work with him, and you know he made a post over the weekend talking about really the state of O line development in the NFL is not great. I mean, you you can count how many good offensive line coaches, 
Like, why can you why can you name only a couple offensive line coaches, but you can name many great play callers? Is it just because of it's a more nobody glamorous cares. Yeah, spot? Nobody cares about the offensive line. I, I think you would know more about them if if there were more good ones out there. But me and Alex you know, were having this conversation the other day about I said that Wyatt Teller was slept on, and he goes, "Dude, no, he's not. He's like one of the three best guards in the league." I'm like, "Yeah, nobody cares about who the three best guards in the league are." That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's yeah, fair. no, I, I think I, you know, I think there's something to be said about that in offensive line play, but again, he's, he's got a point. Is the offensive line, offensive line play, and maybe this is what he was saying: the development isn't there, and that's why I'm what I'm about to say is true. I think is true. Offensive line play has been so bad as of lately. I mean, it's like, well, yeah, finding a tackle, and then okay, finding a quarterback, finding a cornerback finding a tackle, finding a pass rusher. I mean, finding good offensive linemen is near impossible for some organizations to do. Unless you're having, you know, those can't miss, you know, top five left tackles that are just, you know, Mackay Becton. You know, you, can't, you couldn't miss on that guy. So I, I just, I, it's bad. Like everything right. from the second round and on has just been bad recently on the offensive line. I don't know if that's coaching or if it's the prospects. Maybe it's the college coaching. I don't really know, but it's something's missing in the in the formula to produce good offensive linemen. Right. So again, uh, hopefully Dwayne Ledford. Uh, again, what what we've seen is just limited in preseason. They're running vanilla offense, um, but hoping what's been said about him, you know, is true. He uh, apparently he's a diamond in the rough type coach that's, you know, making the jump to the NFL. And again, uh, you know, the Falcons have invested talent in the early rounds with obviously Jake Matthews being a former first round pick, Chris Lindstrom, hopefully continues to come into his own. You know, I'm not, I'm not giving up on Caleb McGarry. I know some seem to worry about the right tackle position, but I'm not in that camp. I think again, He's shown flashes, and now let's see what this coaching staff can do with those flashes, if he can be consistent with that. And then Hennessy, again, guy I've been bullish on, guy I think is going to be just fine. Uh, you know, and the fact that, you know, they don't seem concerned about them as opposed to, you know, left guard obviously has been uh, an ongoing competition, where center hasn't been a competition since the opening days of training camp. So really it's just this one spot. We've been belaboring it. Hopefully they figure something out. Maybe they got something up their sleeve, but I, I do think likely Josh Andrews is going to start and, and we'll see how long of a leash he has. Uh, Cause you know, Alex, you pointed out it's a murderer's row of defensive tackles on tabs right at the start with the likes of, you know, Fletcher Cox and, you know, Vita Vea and Dominic and Sue and uh, you know, Washington and, and, and they're, you know, crazy defensive front. So they're going to get tested early. Uh, what I would say is, you know, hopefully there's going to be heavy play action right off the bat because that'll help any offensive line. But it's it's when you get into those, you know, third and longs that you really can't necessarily do that. That's when, you know, all eyes are going to be on the left guard and, and even the center a little bit just because, you know, I would imagine they're going to slide protections that side. But, yeah, something to look forward to to week one. I, we'll talk about it next week uh, when they have an Eagles guest on to, to talk about that matchup. Um, but I guess the last thing to touch on, and I don't know how many takes you guys have on this, but was really amped and excited uh, to see this On The Rise video series uh, debut on Monday. Uh, I think Alex is me and you, we recorded a show together uh, about a month or so ago. And we talked about how, you know, every team is doing this or most every teams are starting to do it. Uh, the ones that aren't are really falling behind from a media standpoint, you know, these docu-series, these hard knocks esque docu-series that kind of take you behind the curtain, you know, of your favorite football team. So that, you know, for the hardcore fans like us that can't get enough of it, you know, we want to learn more about it. I mean, I, the, the Carolina Panthers one was amazing. At least the one I watched where you literally watched their GM, Scott Fitterer, have a conversation with an agent about, I think, Dan Arnold, the tight end, and, and doing the negotiations and, you know, how do we get to the right number? We want you here, but, you know, we, 
we got salary cap constraints here and just seeing conversations like that. And again, the first, the first episode really just functioned as a hype video, which again, it, it did its job. It got me hyped for week one, even more than I was, but I'm hoping it, it's just a, you know, a table setter, uh, to bigger things, you know, more an all access pass, but, um, what are your guys' thoughts on on the video series? Do you, do you think it's just going to be the the normal stuff, or you know, as far as the hype stuff, and just uh, or do you think we're going to truly get what we want here? Go ahead, Jake. Uh, nothing crazy on it. I actually haven't watched it yet. I've been watching the Secret Base, the the history of the Atlanta Falcons. Okay, well, it's, all right. Take takes on that. I haven't watched any. I, I watched the first episode of that. Uh, you oh, enjoyed yeah, that, incredible. right? From what? I, yeah, it's incredible. Watch it for sure. What what uh what's your f- favorite episode so far? Is it the one that the Mike Vick and the Bobby Petrino just finished? Or yeah, that just came out today. Yeah, it was great. The next one it ended in 07. Obviously, Petrino was the end of it. So the next episode will be like yeah. drafting Matt Ryan and, and more recent. Stuff, yeah. So. so that that was your favorite episode to date. You thought that was the best one? Oh yeah, because that my one friend said the uh, the 1991 or when they were talking about you know the too legit to quit team. Like he's not even a Falcons fan. He was watching and he said. You know, that, that team was low key, like a lot of fun. I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's probably one of the best teams in franchise history just to watch from an entertainment standpoint. So I'm hoping this week I maybe I get a chance to kind of catch up and binge it. I watched the first episode, kind of didn't pay f- full attention to it. Um, but uh, yeah, I've heard good things. So, Alex, thoughts on either of those series? Uh, yeah, I haven't watched the uh, one that Jake's talking about, but I did watch that first episode of uh, On the Rise. Yeah. And um, I mean, it's just satisfying to finally see, you know, a little bit inside the organization. Uh, I, I remember talking about it and we were just perplexed about why you wouldn't do it. I mean, there's it's only beneficial. There are no downsides to, you know, showing a different side. I mean, it's hard knocks is a slam dunk every year. Doesn't matter yeah. who, what the team is. <laughs> It gets views. It gets views. Like you might not like yeah. it, but it gets yeah. views, and that's all that ma- I'm talking from a from the Falcon standpoint. There's only money to be made. There's only money to be made. It really, I mean, I will. I watched a YouTube video that the Chargers put out the other day, and it had like two hundred and fifty thousand views. I mean, what what? And I know the Falcons are a billion dollar company, whatever, whatever, but mm-hmm. come on. I mean, this is not, it's fan experience. It's revenue. It's just another branch that you can do. I mean, it's, you want to have the best possible product for everything. And th- this is such a no brainer to me. I mean, I really don't get it. The only reason it would be downside is if you had, you know, a Bill Belichick type coach that was like, you know, I don't want these cameras in my face or something like that. I don't know, but yeah. I just think that they're – I'm thankful that they're doing it uh, because I don't see a downside whatsoever. That's what I think. And the yeah, I mean, fans are going to love it if you haven't seen it. Go watch it. It's, it's cool. It's an it's an entertainment business after all. And, you know, I, are they worried about insider information getting out? I mean, these teams talk amongst themselves all the time. Like GMs are having conversations – it's not like they're putting draft boards up there. They're, they're blurring that stuff out, which is fine and understandable. Um, but just to see, you know, a glimpse into their process, uh, and that's what we're here for. I mean, as content creators, you know, that's that's how we live and breathe off of off of this stuff. And sometimes it's tough with the Atlanta media to get some of this information. Um, and when we do, I mean, again, it's a breath of fresh air. So hopefully, we we get a chance. I was trying to get Scott. I told you guys off air, trying to get Scott Bear back on the show to talk about it. I don't know how large of a part he's played it. I would imagine somewhat, but I mean, he's got to just okay it. He's got to say yes to it. Yeah. Well, again, they have a video team, so I don't know if it's the video team versus. Well, he's he's, definitely he's more on the. the, I think he's the yeah he's he's the the digital managing editor, so he's definitely and he's he's the newest change to everything. Right, he's the guy that's you know some of the video staff and stuff has remained in place, but he's been the one different. So yeah, I would imagine uh, he's a big part of that. So, you know, shout out to Scott, friend of the show. Um, you know, I'm excited to see what episode two and, and so on brings. Anything else you guys want to talk about uh, 
before we head out, we're almost at the one one hour mark. Anything you want to plug? Um, Jake and Matt are going to hate me, but I got, you know, just given my opinion on this recent Julio Jones and Arthur Blank um, information that just came. So if you see it out there, give it a read. It's just my opinion on it. That's all. We don't have to talk about it anymore. I know. It's yeah, definitely Jake. a juicy, juicy article, uh, you know, that dropped on The Athletic that Alex is alluding to. Um, just a sad way for it then. That's that's all I got to say. I mean, just sad. So, but yeah, we've talked about that enough. Again, hopefully uh, we get some positive things, you know, next week's game week. Um, like I said, I'm going to try to get an Eagles analyst on to – uh, preview uh, the game. We're going to try to do that each week um, to the best of our abilities. Get a, get a analyst from each team, preview the game for the first half hour, and then we'll we'll touch on the game that was. Um, maybe pull up some all twenty two clips. Get you guys making uh, the effort to watch the YouTube stream so that you can see, you know, what went right, what went wrong uh, in the game that was. Um, and then maybe we'll have a chance, uh, you know, we haven't done a mailbag in a while, so maybe at some point we'll bring that back, um, to answer some of your questions. We could do a mailbag on the bye week. Yeah. Or maybe, uh, you know, if we, if we preview, uh, the, the game next week, the last half hour, I don't know what we're going to talk about per se. Maybe there's some other roster transactions, but we can consider doing a mailbag for the last half hour there. Um, we'll play it by ear, but that's kind of our plan for the season. Um, again, this is, I guess, officially the last off season show. It's hard to believe we've done 18 of these. It's gone fast. Um, but again, it's just the beginning. Uh, so we're hoping, uh, you guys are along for the ride. We appreciate those that have been there with us already. Um, so with that being said, uh, for Jake Gordon, Alex Lord, I'm Matt Carley. This has been another talk and birdie go Falcons.